Hey, my name is Conan Liu. I'm a first year internal medicine resident, and this is six questions to ask on each of your third year medical rotations and the most common PIM questions that you're going to get when you're doing these rotations. So as I was going through third year, I frequently was wondering, you know, is there just a standard set of questions that I could use by default whenever I'm seeing each patient? And that's how I kind of came up with the idea for this video. Uh, in summary, this is basically a slide of all the questions. I'm going to be making a video for each one of these. First, I'm going to start off with surgery, and, and then I'm going to go through all the rest of these uh, videos as well. So let's start with surgery. Surgery is going to be the most in-detail video. Um, I guess I'm going to have the most pimp questions to help you guys with. Um, and the reason for that is that there's this amazing uh, book called Surgical Recall that gives a lot of pimp questions uh, that I'll talk about later. But anyways, this is the six questions that I think are the most important questions to ask on surgery. And these are questions that you can basically ask every time you go see your patient in the morning. And the reason these questions are so important is because they're basically all things that need to be improving or going in the right direction prior to a patient being discharged. Their pain has to be controlled. They need to be eating without nausea and vomiting. They should be peeing, pooping, and walking. So the great thing about these questions is that this basically becomes your presentation in the mornings. Surgery presentations tend to be only like one minute to two minutes long. And you basically say something like, hey, this is a 58-year-old man, post-op day two from lysis of adhesions. He says his pain is well controlled. It's currently about a four out of 10. He is eating without any nausea and vomiting. He still has a Foley catheter in, and he has not started to have bowel movements yet, but he is passing gas, and he has not started walking yet. In terms of vitals, his vitals are within normal limits and stable. Uh, physical exam is unchanged from before. His dressings are clean, dry, and intact, and his labs are within normal limits as well. So overall plan for him will probably need at least another day or two before discharge. Another point that I want to bring up for your surgery rotation is that all patients should have a four-hour post-operative check. So after they come out of the OR, they're going to be in the PACU, and then they're going to eventually transition to a room. You need to go assess them four hours after this happens and just to get a good idea of how they're doing after surgery. And also, uh, this is something that happens a lot prior to discharge is that a patient will get their Foley pulled, and they should be voiding within six to eight hours after getting their Foley pulled. So... This is something that you can do to help out your residents is to go check that and make sure that they've peed and that'll really smooth the discharge process up. All right, so now let's go into the most common pimp questions that you'll get on your surgery rotation. And this was the basically holy grail for me in terms of getting a ton of pimp questions right. I really love the format of this book, Surgical Recall. It basically is just a question and answer format and it has so many of the questions that they're gonna be asking you on your surgery rotation. So let's just get right into it. So what is a mnemonic for causes of fever after surgery? This is the famous wind, water, wound, walking, and wonder drugs mnemonic. So this basically states that in the first 24 to 48 hours after surgery, the most common cause of fever would be atelectasis. Within three days of surgery, the most common cause would be a UTI. Within five days, the most common cause would be a wound infection. Around seven days, the most common cause would be a DVT or PE. And if at any point it's unclear where the fever is coming from, you should start wondering about drugs being a cause of fever. One thing to note is that atelectasis is, you know, a commonly pimped question where they ask what the first 24 to 48 hour cause of fever is, but this has actually not been shown in the literature. Most likely, I think this is related to inflammation and cytokine release from a procedure which causes a transient fever right after surgery, but atelectasis has actually never been shown or proven to be a cause of a fever itself. What is it called when there's no bowel movements immediately after surgery? That's called ileus. The most common electrolyte cause of this is hypokalemia, so make sure people's potassium is within a good range. And also, this is why it's so important to check if people are passing gas and having bowel movements after surgery. What is it called if somebody's not having bowel movements several days after surgery? Now that would be a small bowel obstruction. So this would be somebody who's having bowel movements after surgery, leaves the hospital, and then comes back a few days later or years later even, and is not having bowel movements, and that would be a small bowel obstruction. The most common cause of small bowel obstruction in adults, and this is a question you will definitely be pimped on, so very important to know, uh, but the most common cause is adhesions, so surgical scar tissue from the past uh, leading to obstruction. Uh, 
Most common cause of small bowel obstruction in kids would be hernias. This is because they've typically not had as many surgeries as adults have had. Uh, so hernia is actually a more common cause in adhesions. What is the size of a hernia, which is more dangerous? This would be a smaller hernia. This is because if you imagine a large uh, hernia, you know, it's going to have a very low chance of getting incarcerated or strangulated. But if you have a very narrow opening, there's a higher chance that that bowel could get incarcerated, become ischemic, and that would be very dangerous. What is the landmark that marks the division of the upper GI tract versus the lower GI tract? Again, this is a question you will definitely receive on your surgery rotation. And this is the ligament of trites. So here is a uh, graphic of where the ligament of trites is. So you have the first part of your duodenum, second part, third part. And then once you get to this juncture right here, you have the suspensory ligament of trites. So everything above here is upper GI and everything below here is lower GI. What is a rule for estimating normal common bile duct diameter? This is an important one because patients who have gallstone disease, this will give you a good estimate of whether their common bile duct is considered dilated or not. So this is five millimeters plus one millimeter per decade over the age of 50. So if you have a 70 year old woman, for example, their common bile duct could be up to seven millimeters in size and that would be considered normal. But if it was past seven millimeters, then you could consider it dilated and more likely suggestive of gallstone disease. When does third spaced fluid tend to mobilize back intravascularly after surgery? I was asked this question quite a lot when I was on my surgery rotation and that's post-op day three. So if somebody has a lot of edema after their surgery, or if they're a little bit volume down, you can say that on day three, you would start expecting some of that fluid to come back into their intravascular space. What are some factors that predispose to poor healing? Very common lifestyle factors. Uh, this would be diabetes and smoking. All patients who smoke should be ideally uh, not smoking for eight weeks prior to their elective surgical procedures. What are the two different types of closure? There's primary closure and there's secondary closure. Primary closure is basically when they suture up the incision on the day of the procedure, whereas secondary is when there's a larger wound, sometimes they'll let it kind of stay open for three to five days before suturing it at that point. When can dressings be removed? That's post-op day two. And when can a patient shower? Also post-op day two. What is the most important risk factor for mortality during surgery? That would be CHF. And a test that we use to determine cardiac risk prior to surgery is the RCRI, or the Revised Cardiac Risk Index Score. You can also use the Gupta score. The importance of the arcuate line, this is something that you will definitely be asked, and I was asked this multiple times on my surgery and OBGYN rotations. But basically, there is no posterior rectus sheath below the arcuate line. So if you take a look at this diagram, the arcuate line is kind of located in this lower part of the abdomen. And if you look at this sagittal section, you'll see that anteriorly you have the rectus sheath all the way down. And here you have the posterior rectus sheath, but once you get to the arcuate line, it kind of goes forward and then you no longer have a posterior rectus sheath below the arcuate line. What is the first layer of tissue that you will see under the skin? And this is another huge, huge question that you will definitely be asked. Basically what they're going to do is they're going to just open the skin and then they're going to show you this layer and they'll be like, what's that? And the answer to that would be the camper fascia, which is basically the superficial fatty layer right under the skin. And this is a really common pimp question, so make sure you know this. Next is another question that I got asked frequently on my general surgery rotation. And what is the layer of tissue that comprises the hernia sac? Basically, you're going to be doing a hernia repair surgery, and they're just going to show you this and be like, what's that? What's this layer? And the answer to that is peritoneum. What is a mnemonic for the primary evaluation of trauma? I'll go over this later, but it's A, B, C, D, E. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. What is a GCS value at which intubation is indicated? It would be any GCS of eight or less. There is a mnemonic for different components of the GCS, and that is four eyes, Jackson 5, and six engine motor. So there's 15 points total, and this is the different components that make up those 15 points. So if you look here, there's four points that you can get for their eye opening, five points for their verbal response, and six points for possible motor responses. What are the five locations that a patient can bleed out from? That would be the chest, abdomen, pelvis slash retroperitoneum, the extremities, and the floor. And what is the fastest test that you can use to assess for internal bleeding in a trauma patient? That would be the FAST exam. And basically, they take an ultrasound and look at four to five key areas. And those areas are the hepatorenal recess, also known as the Morrison's pouch, the perisplenic space, 
the pericardium, the pelvis, and then with the EFAST exam, they also look at the pleural space to look for any hemothorax. Next, I'm going to go into basically some eponyms that you might be asked about. So what is a test that looks for the patency of the ulnar artery before placing an A-line or an ABG? That would be Allen's test. So basically, you press down on both their radial and their ulnar arteries and ask them to make a fist until it becomes pale. Then you let go of one of the arteries and watch the color return to their hand, which indicates that their ulnar artery or radial artery is patent. What is a sign that is defined by constant dullness to percussion in the left flank and shifting dullness in the right flank? That would be balance's sign, which is a sign of splenic rupture. Echimosis over the mastoid process is called battle sign, indicating basilar skull fracture, and it looks like this. What is a palpable shelf on rectal exam? That's called bloomer shelf, which is indicative of metastatic disease. This is a question that I got asked on my surgery rotation. What is a triad of findings that you can find due to carcinoid tumor? It is FDR, like the president, flushing, diarrhea, and right-sided heart failure. And if they have carcinoid syndrome, you can also add B for bronchospasm, so B, F, D, R. What is a triad of findings that you can find due to cardiac tamponade? That would be Beck's triad, and the triad consists of JVD, hypotension, and muffled heart sounds. What is the triad of findings due to cholangitis called? That is called Charcot's triad, and consists of fever, jaundice, and right upper quadrant pain. There is also a pentad of findings that you can find if somebody has severe cholangitis, and that's called Reynolds pentad, which is Charcot's triad plus shock and altered mental status. A painless enlarged gallbladder is called Courvoisier's sign. This indicates non-gallstone mediated disease. So frequently people say this indicates pancreatic cancer, but this is actually not what Courvoisier's sign indicates. But rather, it just indicates that there's some kind of chronic obstructive process going on that's causing the gallbladder to be enlarged. Twitching of facial muscles upon touching the facial nerve is called Schwaztek sign, and that's a sign of hypocalcemia. Carpal slash wrist spasm in patients during blood pressure measurements is called Trousseau's sign, and that's also a sign of hypocalcemia. And what is the first symptom of hypocalcemia? That would be perioral numbness. Next, what is a sign that's characterized by bruising around the belly button? That's called colon sign, which suggests hemorrhagic pancreatitis. And what is a sign that's characterized by bruising around the flanks? That's called Gray-Turner sign, also hemorrhagic pancreatitis. And you can remember this because you have to turn the body to see Gray-Turner sign, and colon sign is kind of in the middle. So here's an example of colon sign and Gray-Turner sign. What is a rule that states that anterior anal fistulae run a straight course and posterior anal fistulae run a curved course? That's called Goodzall's rule. What are three physical exam signs you can do to test for appendicitis? That would be the obturator sign, the psoas sign, and the Robsing sign. And you should also test for tenderness at McBurney's point. So obturator sign is basically you flex their knee and then internally rotate it and see if that causes pain. In the psoas sign, you have them lying on their side and then you extend their hip backwards to see if that elicits tenderness. And Robsing sign is that even though there's appendicitis in the right lower quadrant, if you have tenderness in the right lower quadrant when you palpate the left lower quadrant, that's suggestive of appendicitis. What is a triad of findings you can find due to insulinoma? That's called Whipple's triad, and it is a triad of hypoglycemia, CNS symptoms, and relief with glucose. Severe edema in extremities causing muscle necrosis, that's called compartment syndrome, and that is a surgical emergency and requires emergent fasciotomy to relieve the pressure. Massive non-obstructive colonic dilatation, also known as pseudo-obstruction, is called Ogilvy's syndrome. So this is basically a patient whose bowel seems to be chronically obstructed, but then you assess and there's never any structural problems, then this is called pseudo-obstruction. Another thing that's useful to know is the stages of pressure ulcers, because a lot of patients in the hospital tend to get pressure ulcers from lying down so much. So there's four stages, they go from one through four. Stage one is basically just some erythema at the top of the skin. Stage two, you start getting a shallow-based ulcer. Stage three, you're kind of going into the fat, maybe a little bit into the muscle. And then stage four, you're going deep into the muscle or all the way to the bone. And once you get to stage three and stage four, these become very, very difficult to heal, uh, especially once you get to stage four. These basically don't really heal anymore. Let's talk about some wound care. So there's a dilute sodium hypochlorite or bleach solution that's used on contaminated wounds. That's called Dakin's solution. 
There is a collagenase solution that's used to debreed wounds, and that's called santal. And then finally, there is a very common dressing that encourages wound healing by micro debridement, and that's called a wet to dry dressing. Basically, you have a wet dressing on the bottom, and then whenever you take it off, it kind of debrides the wound a little bit, and encourages some healing. What is a test that must be obtained before using an NG tube for feeding? That's a chest X-ray or abdominal X-ray. The most common cause of excessive NG tube drainage. This is a common question as well. And basically, this is if you place an NG tube and you place it to suction, and all of a sudden it's draining like three to four liters per day. That's most likely due to placement into the duodenum. So you're basically continuously sucking GI tract secretions into the NG tube. What is a thinner tube that is placed past the pylorus and used only for feeding? That's called a Dobhoff tube, and that's something I wish I knew early on in surgery because people kept talking about Dobhoff tubes, and I had no idea what they were talking about for a little bit. So here's some images. This is an NG tube. You want to make sure that it's going past the diaphragm and going into the stomach. I would probably push this one a little bit further.、Um, what you want to avoid is an NG tube that's going this way. Um, and not passing through the diaphragm. This one is in the lungs, basically. And if you start NG tube feeds in this patient, you're going to cause a huge aspiration event, and it would be extremely dangerous and deadly. And then here's an image of a Dobhoff tube. So you can see it coursing around here. It goes a little bit further than an NG tube, as you can see, it goes past the pylorus. And Dobhoff tubes are used only for feeding and not for suction. Let's talk about the gallbladder because if you do general surgery, you're going to be doing a lot of cholecystectomies. What are the borders of the triangle of Callot? That would be the cystic duct, the common hepatic duct, and the inferior edge of the liver. What is the lymph node in the triangle of Callot called? That's called the Lunds node, often inappropriately called Callot's node, but it's actually the Lunds node, and it's frequently Inflamed in cholecystitis. And what is a view which should be obtained before ligating the cystic duct? This is called the critical view of safety, and this is going to be something that all your surgeons are going to be getting before ligating the cystic duct. So here is just a description. This is the triangle of Callot. Again, it's the inferior edge of the liver, the cystic duct, and the common hepatic duct. You have a node within the center, which is called Lund's node, and is frequently inflamed and enlarged in cholecystitis. And then here you can see the critical view of safety, which involves identifying the cystic artery and the cystic duct before you ligate the cystic duct. This is so you don't accidentally ligate the common bile duct. What is a bariatric surgery that creates a small stomach pouch which connects directly to the jejunum? This is called a Ruin Y gastric bypass, and this is just important to kind of look at the anatomy because I remember always being confused by the anatomy. So basically, what they do is you start in the stomach and you run the bowel and you get to the ligament of trites, and then once you go 30 to 50 centimeters past the ligament of trites, you make an incision, and then with that other incision,、uh, you take about 130 centimeters and connect it directly to the gastric pouch up here, and that's what creates the Ruin Y gastric bypass. What is a Foley catheter, which has a small curved tip to help maneuver around a large prostate? That's called a Code catheter. What is the minimal urine output for a patient on maintenance IV? That would be 30 milliliters an hour, or 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. This is something that'll come up a lot, especially in intern year, because nurses are going to start paging you for people with decreased urine output. So this gives you a good idea of how much a typical patient should be making at the bare minimum. What is a very low rate of tube feeds, which helps reduce the risk of stress ulcers? What is that called? That's called trophic feeds or trickle tube feeds. You'll see this commonly in ICU settings because patients are not able to eat. And what is the way to get a definitive airway if an endotracheal intubation is unsuccessful? That would be a cricothyroidotomy. What if somebody comes in with a tension pneumothorax and you need to do emergency needle decompression? What's the location for that? That would be the second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line, and then where would you place a chest tube eventually for longer term management of the pneumothorax? That would be in the fourth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line. So here's a graphical depiction of where you would do the emergency needle decompression versus a standard chest tube placement. What are the three chambers of a chest tube pleurovac? That's collection, water seal, and suction, and I'll go over what those mean briefly. How is a chest tube placed on water seal? This is basically something you do when you think a patient's pneumothorax is resolving, and you basically want to turn the chest tube suction off to see if the pneumothorax reaccumulates or if it stays stable. And the way you do this is just by turning off the suction. You basically turn the chest tube off. 
So taking a look at the three different chambers, you have the collection chamber, which collects blood, fluid, anything like that. You have a water seal. The reason you need the water seal is that it prevents air from going from the outside of the body into the lung. And then the last section is the suction control, which is attached to the wall, and you turn it on to help remove air from the body. One way to check that everything is working is to look in the water seal, and you should see little gas bubbles coming up here if a pneumothorax is being suctioned out from the chest tube. What is a hemorrhage classification at which you start getting tachycardia and hypotension? That would be a class 3 hemorrhage. So basically there's four classes of hemorrhage and it's basically determined on how much percent blood you've lost. And class three is when you start actually getting vital sign changes. So tachycardia, decreased systolic blood pressure. Whereas with class one and class two hemorrhages, uh, the body can actually compensate pretty well for those and you might not see vital change signs at that time. What is a score that's used for determining likelihood of necrotizing fasciitis? That would be the Lurinex score. And the Lurinex score is characterized by these components. There's two different types of hiatal hernias. There's a type 1 sliding hiatal hernia and a type 2 paraesophageal sliding hernia. So this is a type 1 hernia, and here is a type 2. Type 1 can usually be managed by observation and medical management, but type 2 will always need surgical intervention and correction. What is it called when you have two separate fractures in three or more consecutive ribs? That's called a flail chest. And also, if you have a patient with paradoxical movement of the chest wall when breathing, that also occurs in flail chest. Here's a graphical depiction. Basically, you have multiple fractures in consecutive ribs, and this causes this piece of rib to basically just be free-floating, so that's why you get that paradoxical air movement. The treatment for flail chest is generally intubation with positive pressure. One of the reasons is that the positive pressure helps prevent the paradoxical movement. Uh, and also this condition is just very painful. So patients tend to be not taking deep breaths, which they need to do when they have this condition. What is a treatment for a general rib fracture? Uh, that would be really focused around pain control. So sometimes if it's very severe, then you can use an epidural injection in order to provide pain control. You really want to avoid opiates in these patients. The reason pain control is so important in rib fractures is because patients will be taking really shallow breaths, and this can cause atelectasis and eventually lead to pneumonias, uh, all sorts of complications like that. And the reason you avoid opiates is to avoid respiratory depression because these patients will already be taking smaller breaths than normal. And this is another common question that gets asked, but what are indications for emergent thoracotomy for hemothorax? This would be if you place a chest tube and it's draining greater than 1.5 liters as soon as you place it, or if you're draining greater than 200 cc's an hour for four hours after placing a chest tube. What are two common types of drains that are placed after surgery? That would be the JP drain and the Penrose drain. The Penrose drain is an open drain. The advantage of this is it's less likely to get blocked, but the downside of this is that it increases the risk of infection. The JP drain is one that I saw more commonly, but this is a closed drain. Uh, the risk of infection is reduced, but there may be a slightly higher risk of getting it obstructed, and this is called a Jackson Pratt drain. What type of dressing should be used for an open pneumothorax? This is a three-sided occlusive dressing. Basically, you put tape on three sides, and then you leave one flap open so air can escape, but air cannot go in. What are the two different types of aortic dissection? There's two different classification systems, but the main one is uh, you can classify them as type A versus type B. And if it's type A, then it's involving the ascending aorta. And if it's type B, it's only involving the descending aorta. So uh, if it's involving both, then it's still considered a type A aortic dissection. Type A aortic dissections will always need surgical intervention, whereas type B can undergo medical management first. Now let's move on to talking about burns because this is an important part of surgery. What is a method that can be used to quickly estimate total body surface area that's burned? This is the rule of nines. And basically this states that the head is about 9% of the body surface area. Torso and back is about 18%. Lower extremities, 18%. And upper extremities, 9% each. Are partial thickness or full thickness burns more painful? That would be a partial thickness burn. That's because in a full thickness burn, you've actually burned off all the nerve endings. So they actually experience less pain than people with partial thickness burns. What are the layers of skin that are involved in a first degree burn? This is the epidermis only. In a second degree burn, it's the epidermis and part of the dermis. And then finally, in a third degree burn, you have the epidermis and the entire dermis, which are affected. 
If you wanted to quickly estimate the amount of body surface area by using a patient's hand, uh, that actually represents about 1% body surface area. So if they have a small burn, this could be an easier way to estimate how much surface area has been burned. What's an important formula that can be used to calculate fluid resuscitation in burn patients for the first 24 hours? That is the Parkland formula. And these patients really need a lot of fluid because when you have bad burns, you're basically third spacing a ton of fluid. So these people are very dehydrated when they first come in. The equation of the above formula is their weight in kilograms times the percent body surface area burned times four. And basically what you do is you give the first half in the first eight hours and then the second half of the fluid resuscitation over the next 16 hours. Now I want to go back into the initial management of a trauma patient. Again, I said I was going to talk about the ABCDE, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. So this is based off the advanced trauma life support protocol. The premise of this is to treat the greatest threat to life first, and it was originated in 1976 when an orthopedic surgeon crashed his plane in Nebraska. And again, the ABCDE is called your primary survey. So let's talk about how to conduct the primary survey. So first for airway, the main question is, does this patient need to be intubated or not? The fastest way that you can assess if a patient has an airway is to ask them for their name. And if they can tell you their name, then you know they have an airway and they don't need to be intubated right now. Breathing, you want to inspect their chest, auscultate, and check for bilateral breast sounds. If they have no bilateral breast sounds, then you need to consider a needle decompression for a pneumothorax. Again, that's at the second intercostal space, midclavicular line. After checking airway and breathing, then you move on to C for circulation, and that involves assessing their blood pressure and heart rate. The fastest way to assess if a patient has appropriate circulation is to palpate their pulses. Uh, if they have a femoral pulse, that indicates that their systolic blood pressure is at least over 60, and if they have a radial pulse, then it's at least 80 systolic. If a patient has hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock, what's the next step that you have to do immediately? That would be to obtain two large bore IVs. If you can't obtain two large bore IVs, then you can obtain intraosseous access or IO access. What are the places you can bleed out from? Again, this is the floor and four more. So the thorax, abdomen, pelvis, extremities, and floor. And then you want to assess if their pelvis is stable. If the pelvis is unstable, the next step would be placing a pelvic binder. Moving on through the primary survey, next you have D, which stands for disability. And I was always confused by what the disability stands for. Basically, this is an assessment of the Glasgow Coma Scale, again, using the four eyes, five, Jackson 5, and six engine motor to see what their Glasgow Coma Scale is. The max score is 15 or 11T if they're intubated. And the minimum score is 3. Uh, again, what's a GCS score? That's an indication for intubation. That would be a GCS of 8 or less. And finally, you have E for exposure, which basically states that you need to strip the patient of all their clothes so you can basically do a full exam. You want to rotate their patient on their side, assessing their spine for step-off deformities, and you want to do a rectal exam to check for their rectal tone and assess if there's any blood, which would be an indication that they are having an internal bleeding source. Then finally, after you conduct the primary survey, you move on to the secondary survey, which is something that you conduct after vital signs start normalizing. It's basically a head-to-toe evaluation, including a complete history and physical exam. Some tests that you get during the secondary survey include a chest x-ray, a quick test to assess for bleeding in a trauma patient, which again is the FAST exam. These are the four places that you check. And then labs, EKG, CT, etc. All right, that's it for my surgery video. Uh, hopefully this was useful for you. Next, we're going to be moving on to psychiatry, internal medicine, family medicine, OBGYN and pediatrics. Those videos I expect to be quite a bit shorter and I will be going through them a little bit more quickly. Um, but surgery, there was plenty of information. The surgical recall book is super helpful and I really think you guys can do a great job on your surgery rotation. So hopefully you found, you learned some new things in this video and found some things that were helpful. And let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the video and would like to see more. And thanks for watching. See you in the next video.